Hey everyone, this is Rahul Mahajan. Today I'm going to specifically talk about the advancements in the language model that have been happening. This is in continuation to me sharing some of my experiences and knowledge with the larger community. Uh, so let's get started. Specifically, uh, we'll today go deep into exploring Transformers architecture and uh, specifically talking about the advancements in the language model. Some of the recent innovations that we have started seeing is uh, I think last three, four years is, is models coming out from uh, some of the leading companies like Google, uh, OpenAI, models like BERT, Duplex, or ChatGPT, some of these things have been coming out. And, and uh, specifically, um, we'll go to the deep into what has been some, what has been the reason behind some of these improvements what has been kind of the driver for, for these things. And it's important to understand that from a larger NLP, non-language processing perspective, industry is not new, it's more than maybe three decades or four decades uh, old. Uh, even some of the AI related elements uh, have been there since the last almost a decade. Uh, primarily what has changed is is mostly around uh, specific way we have started kind of uh, understand started giving more importance to understanding the context uh, when we translate the word also some of the advancements that we have done in terms of uh, making the architectures more friendly for parallel computing this is very very important because if your architecture is friendly to parallel computing you can actually throw a lot of training data which we anyways know that large part of today AI, in fact, 99% of it, what models we have needs tons and tons of training data, good or bad. So hence we need, uh, the fact remains that we need architectures which are computational friendly, which can allow distributed learning, parallel computing, and any place where the architecture starts uh, kind of, um, uh, any any time when architecture leads to any kind of bottlenecks or limiting function in terms of processing is generally what we like to avoid. So let's go a little deep into what we have been saying uh, and try to understand. Uh, so I'll spend maybe a few minutes to a little bit uh, uh, spend time on how this whole journey has evolved over the time. Uh, it's important uh, to have a little bit also understand what has been happening historically. So when we do language translation, which is slightly a specialized way of looking at uh, uh, is a special kind of a classifier in a lot of ways. It's different from uh, image or visual uh, semantic classification. Language classification uh, has certain specific uh, characteristics that model should be able to embrace. For example, when we speak, uh, or when we when we uh, when we enter a sentence that needs to be translated or understood, the sentence has certain words, and and when when we look at these words, these words have to be understood in the larger context of the sentence. Uh, so it's important to understand the larger sentence before we predict. For example, if the problem is about predicting the next best word, it's important to understand what words have come, uh, what words have came before. Uh, the prediction uh, step uh, because the next step has to be in context to our continuation to the previous step. Now this is where uh, some challenges come with neural networks. Neural networks uh, which by and large are stateless architectures, they don't have memory inherent into it. Uh, so few things were done in, in historically to um, bring uh, some kind of context into the uh, specifically required for language model to neural networks. Recurrent neural networks or uh, uh, over the time uh, LSTMs, long short term memory based architectures came in. What you see on the screen is kind of a is kind of an uh, is kind of a improvement that was done over over uh, raw neural network. What you see on the screen is is a, is a three step process. Uh, essentially, it's combination of uh, uh, each part of the sentence going sequentially into the neural network. So what you see on the screen is uh, uh, different parts of the word, which is xt minus one, uh, xt, 
and X3 plus 1. These are different parts of the world which are gradually going into the uh, neural network. And there are few tactics that have been uh, uh, researched over the time using which we try to build the context. Uh, for example, uh, when we process a specific word, let's say XT, we try to understand what has come before and, 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 and specifically what could be the prediction. And even in, uh, even in uh, recurrent neural networks, we try to uh, essentially uh, do the same thing where the goal is to uh, understand whether or not to activate but then before we do the activation of a specific input uh, there is a kind of a input available from the previous step uh, in this case sigma which is feeding it into the activation function uh, which could be a, any active standard activation function sigmoid or tan h but then one of the input is previous step output. This is one way you essentially try to make sure the network understands the, the context before it predicts. Uh, but this has certain disadvantages, whether it is RNNs, whether it is LSTM. One, you have to go sequentially uh, because uh, as you can see, different parts of the words have to be fed in uh, sequentially. Second, uh, 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 this can only remember, uh, depending on the length of the sentence, uh, the architectures easily get compli complex, uh, they slow down, parallel processing is generally not possible and there is little that is being done here to understand the sentence context other than what's there in the previous word, which is very, very, very basic way to understand the context. Now, what can be done to improve it? Uh, what can be what 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 are the possibilities here, right? So one of the improvements that came in was this whole encoder decoder ways of uh, looking at architectures. Now encoder decoder in a lot of ways is a two-step process. Uh, in this two-step, uh, essentially uh, we try to look at uh, as encoder as a step number one, where we give the entire sentence that needs to be translated as an input to the larger network network has hidden states uh, h1 h2 hm all of these are like hidden states but it's it's you know, some of the improvements that and then uh, i'll talk about the improvements but let's first understand the whole thing so there's an encoder step there is a attention step and then there's a decoder step essentially it's a three there are three big modules to this whole architecture uh, in the encoder step input is the uh, is the is the input text the source text uh, attention is what is derived and decoder the starting point is the prediction what we what system wants to predict uh, and and essentially the goal is to uh, calculate this context this context then becomes an input to the decoder uh, and in whatever translation uh, happens factors in this context, necessary modifications happen in this context, using this context and, and predictions are generated out of it. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's one of the broad level way to understand encoder, decoder and attention as a three step uh, in, in the larger architecture. In terms of some of the, some of the reasons these were things were done, uh, were primarily around uh, to first of all make sure we just don't look at the previous part of the sentence. So think of a sliding window protocol or sliding winding algorithm which typically is sliding on the sentence from left to right, left being the start of the sentence and right being the end of the sentence. If you do that way which essentially what historical LSTMs and RNNs were, you are essentially focusing on, on, on the left part of the input sentence and that's generally not the best way to do it because if the sentence or the or the input has to be looked into uh, the input has to be analyzed and uh, with its all entire context so it's important to take the entire input uh, into the system uh, look at all the parts of the sentences uh, calculate some kind of importance for various parts of the sentences specifically things like pronouns uh, one uh, the system should know what this specific pronoun is, is pointing towards. Like uh, Rahul is a computer professional and he has been working in this 
profession for last two decades. Now, when it comes around, he he is referring to the subject which is Rahul. How do you build these kinds of derived context? Uh, and that's the whole uh, ch- challenge that uh, at least for now uh, we have been trying to ensure that our architectures cover. So, uh, one of the research paper that came out a uh, uh, few years back from uh, specifically from Google was around uh, how to build this context using attention uh, and this is a paper um, I re- uh, th- this is a paper which came out somewhere around I think 2017 or 18 uh, and essentially highlights the uh, importance of building context uh, but if, before we talk about the Transformers paper, it's important to also look at some of the work that was done prior to that or around that same time. Uh, uh, so this is uh, kind of uh, a precursor to uh, some of the modern Transformers that we now have, which are purely neural network based, uh, non-RNN based. But, but even in RNNs, we did certain improvements. First of all, as I said uh, just a minute back, it's important to analyze the entire sentence, not just the initial part of the sentence. Hence, uh, bidirectional RNNs essentially means uh, if you look at the if you look at the architecture on the right, uh, where x1, x2, x3 are different parts of the sen- different words of the sentence, input sentence. H1, H2, H3 is is a is a feed forward and a feed feed backward mechanism. Essentially, we want to make sure uh, if it goes through two layers. Uh, we look at the forward part of the sentence and we also look at the backward part of the sentence and using uh, using uh, back propagation to understand certain uh, weights uh, we do uh, necessary activations these activations uh, as a uh, kind of a uh, in submission uh, when when they are taken helps us calculate this context and uh, essentially the goal is to make sure uh, that each weight uh, the weight of uh, in this case alpha is the weight the weight alpha ij which is one of the weights uh, one of the weights for one of the uh, parts of the architecture uh, it's, it's something which is kind of uh, well distributed uh, it for example it may add up to one uh, all of the weights should add up to one and things like that so these are some of the basic improvements were, which were done uh, and uh, the goal was to calculate this whole context. Uh, one of the ways as I said uh, was to just uh, start with the word, uh, translate this into a, into a vector format using embeddings. I'll talk about the embeddings. Uh, once you are done with the embedding step, give it to neural network through back propagation, understand the weights. But when you uh, design the architecture in a way it looks at the all the parts of the sentence at least in, the, in, in a sequential way you go from uh, left to right and right to left and we try to understand uh, what parts of the sentence are actually important that's and, and, and somehow we uh, using backprop calculate these weights again calculate uh, context accordingly this context becomes input to the decoder which is uh, this top layer uh, this, so this context becomes an input to the decoder. Again in the decoder, we look at different parts of the uh, sentence even in the decoding stage and, and, and that's how we do it. So these were some of the improvements that were done. Now uh, again, uh, as I said, R- RNNs were not the best uh, way to uh, look at uh, neural networks because RNNs inherently doesn't allow us to look at the sentence in a uh, doesn't allow us to compute the sentence in a parallel way hence we wanted that each part of the each part of the sentence different words can all be taken in parallel uh, and and uh, we we understand the attention uh, in the sentence attention again means uh, what parts of the words maps to what part of the other word uh, what maps to what other words in the sentence uh, and then we can do the encoding, decoding, ca- context calculation all in parallel. So that was the larger goal. Uh, this is the paper which came out from, uh, if I'm not wrong, from Google, somewhere around 2017-18, uh, where attention was the main hero of the paper. How do you make sure? How do you make? Sh- 
how do you make architectures where attention is a key thing in terms of calculating because language translations if if you have to do outside rns or lstms we better make sure that attention uh, is calculated more accurately uh, we don't compromise on attention while we parallelize the whole architecture <coughs> so that's the goal uh, on the left you see a broad level of uh, architecture it's two parts uh, again uh, left part is encoder right part is decoder uh, left part we give the input it goes through certain embeddings i'm going to talk about the embeddings uh, which is essentially way to convert text into some numerical vectors like the way we convert text into binary uh, here we convert text or words into vectors so input embeddings are calculated uh, that goes into a multi head attention uh, part of the encoder uh, encoder module uh if you double click on multi head uh, attention module it has other again certain parts of the uh, certain parts uh, and and uh, essentially using i'll talk about that uh, but then multi head uh, attention allows us to calculate uh, attention uh, which is essentially what parts of the words map to what part of the wo other words what's the weight of each part of the word and it goes through certain cycles in this case uh, Uh, six cycles are done at least that's what proposed in the paper and uh, it's a bidirectional network even residual is being handed over to the next step so whatever gets calculated in uh, n minus 1 iteration uh, what's the input to the n minus 1 iteration also uh, goes as an input to the next step so that uh, we don't lose on the actual uh, input Uh, so some of some of these optimizations were researched uh, as part of the work and once we calculate the context then again it goes to the decoder decoder has a similar architecture where again we calculate the context using multi head attention and uh, essentially we try to predict uh, there are certain optimizations around softmax to further simplify uh, the output let me first talk about embedding and then we'll come back to multi head attention uh so embedding has been a very uh, kind of an interesting uh, space uh, for me personally uh largely the goal the problem is to how do we translate word into a vector so for example uh take a sentence uh, or, or take a word let's say rahul right how would you translate uh, rahul is a software professional so how would you translate software into a vector one way is you can just do some kind of basic clustering across different vocabularies in english dictionary uh, and try to uh, find uh, a vector representation uh, it could be based on some kind of uh, similarity uh, essentially the goal is to compute distance there have been certain advancements in in how we how do you compute distance because computing distance between two words is also a very deep problem uh there are certain ways there are certain algorithms in 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 generating embeddings like Glo glove word to vector which uses i think roughly around 64 dimensions in terms of finding uh, the distance uh, and 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 where you compute distance between all of the 64 dimension is you take every dimension you you do a kind of a cosine similarity uh, which is nothing but a dot product uh, in in ways in very simple ways uh, and then you you once you understand similarities in, in different dimensions you eventually do a kind of a weighted average across all dimensions to get an overall similarity score and uh, that's how you also validate whether the embedding is right how effective is the embedding so embedding anyways has has gone through its own iterations uh, and and, uh, and and still i feel there is a lot of room to improve in terms of the way embeddings are calculated because if initial embeddings can be made more crisp um, uh, the whole architecture has can can go much more efficient uh, uh, because computing similarity or computing distances or identifying x right number of dimensions and what those right number of dimensions should be which also has kind of possibly elements of uh, connections to human behavior uh, the larger real world Uh, there are opportunities in terms of way we can calculate embeddings but for now uh, we'll use uh, uh, one of the advanced methods available which is at least the one that's recommended in this paper is glove uh, 
so there is you can download globes embedding it's few gigabytes you can use that and then calculate a vector representation of a word uh, so that's kind of one of the embeddings you give second embedding is as if you remember the rnn step is this sequence is very important the order of the words is very important so we give some kind of positional embedding also so two embeddings uh, two or two kind of uh, uh, transformation happen word first one is where words get translated to a vector which is the basic input embedding second is positional embedding goal of positioning embedding is to make sure the order of these words which one is first which one is second which one is third that order goes uh, uh, also as an input to the larger architecture there are methods how you can generate positional embedding uh, it can it cannot be as simple as just giving 1 2 3 4 5 in running sequence because a good positional embedding algorithm should be bounded should not generate too large values because if you generate too large values in the subsequent step you can introduce unnecessary uh, inflation or great uh, noise to the gradient calculations hence you want to make sure whatever uh, positional embedding you generate is also bounded hence uh, and is also unique so being bounded and, and 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 unique are two absolutely important characteristics of calculating these positional encodings uh, instead of giving a running sequence there are better ways you can do it uh, the ones that have been discussed in this paper and are fairly uh, nice and advanced is at least for the odd parts of the word use sine uh, sine wave because sine wave has a boundness uh, between minus 1 and 1 and also uh, just to make sure uh, it doesn't repeats you scale up the sine wave uh, fairly so that it capture most of the scenarios uh, and for the even parts or the odd parts you give the cosine wave uh, certain transformations of these cosine waves and then you keep uh, for the subsequent iterations you keep introducing a different frequencies of sine waves and cosine waves so it's an intelligent way of, of generating pos positional encodings uh, i would encourage uh, people who wants to go deep into this uh, please look at the paper and some of the research work that have been done so positional encoding and, and uh, vector uh, input embedding are for some of the initial things that are done uh, multi head attention is 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 a common step between encoder and also a common step in, in decoder multi head in attention essentially the goal is to calculate attention right which parts of the word are 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 dependent on other parts and and what's the kind of weightage of a specific word in the uh, to the other parts of the word uh, one way it's done in this paper is there are three uh, vectors uh, query key and value these three vectors are given same input embedding uh, positional embedding and uh, input embedding so uh, every word uh, once goes to through this two embeddings uh, becomes an input to all the three uh, all the three weights uh, uh, so for example if you are embedding is generating uh, let's say five uh, values in a vector and let's say you have seven words so sentence has seven words and and every word has five uh, value five uh, one cross five vector uh, then you give uh, three copies of of such a vector because there are three uh, uh, three different uh, weights that uh, we are proposing in this in this paper to be for for calculating attention uh, so that seven cross five into three goes as an input into uh, 7 cross 5 uh, co uh, three copies of 7 cross 5 are given as an input to this weight vector uh, which is uh, uh, again this weights are, are kind of three uh, three uh, matrix of three uh, hence 5 uh, cross 3 because uh, we have uh, one weight for uh, one part of the embedding uh, so essentially what we are trying to do is uh, calculate a kind of a similarity between uh, so what is this vkq right why did we come out with these three why not four and and what are we trying to do uh, with these three things so essentially the the pattern that that uh, is try we trying to replicate here is that there is a query query is the word input word and the goal is to identify uh, similar words 
or, or contextual words in the in the rest of the sentence, uh, and hence the go uh, uh, there is a query. Uh, there are similar words which is which you can actually look up using a hash key or a key, which is this K, and and depending on what uh, what parts of the words are important, you will have certain values. Uh, so essentially, the goal is to calculate uh, these three uh, parts of the. Uh, three parts of this whole problem uh, so uh, kind of a mod uh, three part three different ways key query and value right and and once you calculate for every word what is the key vector uh, you what is the uh, value vector essentially the goal is then uh, using backprop we try to calculate the weights uh, once we calculate these weights we get this k uh, all the three k q v um, and then essentially the goal is to once we understand these weights uh, then the goal is uh, to calculate this uh, uh, dot product which is nothing but as i said uh, similarity so what parts of the key are similar to uh, are similar to a query or or or, or, or logical to the query hence uh, simple ways to do is again do a kind of a dot product so this is a part of the paper where it's clearly explained that we compute dot products of the query with all the key uh, divide them by root dk that's again done to normalize it but essentially if you see what we're trying to do is do a cosine similarity between query vector key vector transpose has been done because uh, uh, if you have to multiply you have to do a transpose right uh, and then you normalize it by dividing it by root dk so that you don't uh, you, you don't inflate the gradients or you don't deflate the gradients beyond a point uh, so this normalization is important uh, and then we do a soft max and then eventually we we uh, once we average out these weights uh, with a weighted weight we 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 get the attention by uh, overlaying it with value right so that's essentially what attention is it's a computational variable which is nothing but is driven through this uh, variable there are certain different ways uh, BERT does it versus OpenAI GPT does it for example BERT has a slightly more uh, deep uh, connection uh, uh, cross connections versus GPT which has a certain uh, at least uh, GPT also has evolved over the time in terms of the way how it looks at connections and stuff like that and there are other models also uh, so that's how we do it uh, but the goal more or less remains to be compute these three vectors on the input embeddings try to identify the right query and right key map them the right key map the right query to the right key uh, simple ways to still use the same old school cosine uh, similarity uh, calculate this attention vector once you understand this attention vector uh, then uh, uh, try to calculate the overall context uh, and, and and what i've explained is in very simple words at least in the encoder step if you look at essentially that's what we're trying to do uh, we are trying to essentially calculate uh, the different parts of the word the agreement on the euro for example the sentence is the agreement on the european economic areas was signed in august 1992 we are trying to find a uh, kind of uh, context for each of the word attention that right that's over so in multi hand attention um, uh, step we try to calculate this whole attention value for each of the words and uh, again there is uh, a very nice visualization in, in, in one of the research papers that's there uh, where you can see uh, that this is the output vector in this case they're trying to translate into a french sentence so this is the original english sentence this is the french sentence and they're trying to calculate uh, using this attention value what parts of the words are relevant uh, in the french i uh, should while translating to french what part of the french words should uh, factor in what parts of the english words right uh, and, and that's essentially what we call as multi-head self-attention uh, where every part of the word is being looked at uh, with every other word compared with every other word to calculate this thing 
so this these are some of the improvements that have been done uh, in in the recent architectures uh, in transformers uh, where we are trying to essentially to all solve two different parts two different big problems one how do we massively scale these architectures we don't uh, introduce any kind of artificial limiting functions because of the way rnns or lstms used to work second is we are trying to also make the internal architecture more smart by introducing this whole capability of understanding the context uh, which is nothing but attention uh, the way the vocabulary is in, in, in the research paper and and this has led to some amazing results in the way uh, some of these chat function have started behaving uh, but this is at the still at the end of the day if you realize essentially uh, it's still trying to calculate context using the information that's there in the sentence right and and, and i hope that also gives you kind of an input in terms of what's the kind of opportunity further opportunity if we can if we have to further improve these things there is opportunity in terms of improving the way embeddings are generated there is an opportunity in terms of the way uh, these attention vectors are calculated uh, there is an opportunity in the way we look at uh, some of the uh different parts of uh, the input not just text input while we are doing language translation how do we blend uh visual classification and language classification all together uh and then that's where we'll see some of the advancements coming in in, in subsequent years uh, i hope this was uh, at least directionally helpful in terms of helping uh, some of you understand how language models have improved Uh, what are being done in in some of the advancements in some of the research, recent research papers uh, thank you again for your time uh, i hope this was useful uh, thank you we'll talk again bye